pretty uh, intensive year uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 months or so. And in fact, apart from our 360 degree webinars, we've also had the pleasure of uh, hosting a webinar with our parent organization, the IOA. We've had a couple of webinars uh, with SICOT, thanks to Dr. Mrinal, and again, another one with the British Hip Society, all of which were extremely well attended and appreciated. And uh, at the very outset, I'd just like to announce that the uh, last webinar under my presidency will be happening on the 5th of October on hip dislocations, which uh, Dr. Anil Lumen has uh, kindly consented to uh, organize and moderate. And uh, before I, uh, going any further, I'd like to thank Raji for all his help as the overall coordinator of this 360 degree webinar program to make sure that it doesn't flag and to actually keep the interest going even in these uh, times when webinars are no longer the fashion. But it seems that webinars are still very, very relevant given by the viewership that we're having. And so without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Rajiv and then on to Deva, who is the, uh, Dr. Padi, who is the moderator for this evening. So over to Rajiv and then to Deva. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ronan. Uh, thanks, Deva, uh, for uh, convening this uh, webinar. It's on a very interesting topic of uh, revision total knee replacement focused on complications. And uh, interestingly, uh, Dr. Debar, uh, Debardas uh, has uh, ensured that uh, uh, this is only case-based. So uh, all the cases will be presented. We'll be taking up the various uh, uh, difficult uh, situations in a revision TKR. Uh, uh, Dr. Deba uh, will invite the first speaker. Uh, Deba, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ronan, our president and uh, coordinator of the webinar, Dr. Uh, Rajiv uh, Sarma, for this opportunity. And this being a revision uh, uh, webinar, uh, as you know that there is increase in uh, primary needs and advent of uh, these different government schemes. And uh, the increase has become so much that almost 2.5 lakh uh, primary tickets are being done every year in uh, the country. And the increase in primary has also caused an increase in different scenarios of revision. So with this, uh, we started this uh, webinar uh, discussion and uh, uh, we'll begin uh, in his first with uh, our president, Dr. Ronan Roy, speaking on revision, uh, the principles and the not cell. Over to Dr. Ronan, sir. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I was muted. And uh, I'll be talking about the principles of revision so that you can have a, an overview of the whole situation. And then we'll be handling the different cases in the different scenarios. So uh, uh, current failure mechanism, mechanisms, as you see, unlike in the past, is, is mainly instability and aseptic loosening and malalignment, followed by infections. <laughs> and uh, polyethylene wear, which was common earlier, is now no longer the main cause of revision. But before embarking on revision uh, replacements, it's important to understand what the cause of failure is. And the diagnosis of the cause is usually done by the history, the clinical assessment, and investigations on the patient. So it's important to take a detailed history. Was the knee ever right from the time of the operation? Was there a specific time when the pain started? Is it local or is it referred? Are there any other exacerbating factors in this particular patient? The type of knee replacement that was done, was the rehabilitation prolonged? Were there any problems with wound healing? And many other problems that might be associated with the operation or otherwise. And a very important factor is actually to assess what the patient's expectations are. I mean, sometimes you might find a patient who is moaning and groaning, you really can't find anything. And these are the ones that you should be particularly careful about handling. Coming to clinical examination, you look at the range of motion, the extensor mechanism, see if there's any lag or fixed flexion deformity, the tracking of the patella to see if there's any crepitus or clump, the stability of the joint itself, the axial rotatory, the weight bearing, and whether there's a and sag 
because of laxity and the condition of the overall skin, whether there's any signs of dystrophy, scars, local temperature if it's raised, any sinus which will make the diagnosis of the problem obvious or any skin thickening which might also be present. And most importantly, as I mentioned, whether there are any uh, dystrophic changes uh, suggested by an erythema, shiny, thin, loud skin. And the limb vascularity and neurological status is obviously of paramount importance. And serial clinical radiographs often help in making a diagnosis. And the usual standard AP lateral and skyline views, and it's important to compare them with the previous films. And remember, X-rays always tend to underestimate the bone loss. And over and above all, always exclude sepsis because it's uh, very difficult in the uh, revision scenario if you're not prepared and you've opened the joint and pus covers pouring out. So before operating, medically optimize the patient as you would in a primary scenario. Have adequate reserves of uh, time for OT, blood, bone, adequate varieties of implants available, and always have a plan before you start out. Don't just say, oh, I'm doing a, a revision tomorrow and jump into the OT. Then you'll really be jumping into problems. So the basic steps of a revision TKR are, is what we're going to be looking at throughout this evening. And we look at first the skin incision and the surgical exposure, removal of the components, bone loss assessment and management, balancing the gaps, and then finally choosing an implant. So let's first look at the skin incisions and exposure. By and large, Mark your previous incisions. In general, use the lateral most incision. Midline is usually the best if it is safe and possible. Raise full thickness flaps. Don't try and dissect anywhere in between. Avoid crossing scars at acute angles, especially less than 60 degrees, because that actually causes problems with the vascularity. And maintain at least a seven centimeter bridge between incisions if you do have to bridge. Beware of wide scars with thin absent subcutaneous tissue, as we've already discussed, which suggests that the dermal plexus is damaged. And in complicated situ situations, it's always better to get your plastic surgery colleague uh, uh, involved in advance so that you don't actually run into problems. This, we all know there's options that are available for us. If you want to extend it uh, through a normal medial parapetal, you can use a quadriceps snip. If you have an extremely tight knee, as we'll be seeing later on this evening, a tibial tubercle osteotomy is something that is useful. A VUI plasty can be done in uh, difficult scenarios, but again, unfortunately, this leads to thinning of the quadriceps and weakening of the quadriceps and is best avoided if possible. And the femoral appeal has, al always been, has also been described, which Rajiv has gathered on a number of cases with extremely good results. Coming to the removal of implants, the principles of implant removal are, you should try and preserve the bone as far as possible, limit the dissection to the implant cement interface and not the cement bone interface. And it's important that secure implants can be difficult to remove and requires patience. And always check with the manufacturer for implant specific tools. First, you should try and remove the tibial implant because removal in the insert gives you more space to work with. Then you use stacked osteotomes to lever the tibial component away from the bone. And the broad, broadest osteotome is placed closest to the bone, and then gradually you stack up one above the other. And it's important to work on both the medial and lateral side simultaneously, so you don't cause any stress in the proximal tibia. And you must take care not to crush the underlying bone. Coming to the fem femoral implant, Narrow osteotomes or saws can be used to work along the chamfer interfaces or in the narrow space between the fixation pegs of the distal interface. It's best to work from both the medial as well as the lateral side separately. And once the implant is, uh, uh, interfaces are divided, the femoral component can usually be removed with a longitudinal force applied with a slap hammer. Removal of polyethylene components is relatively easy with a saw. Once you've had the implants removed, the next stage is to assess the bone loss and how you're going to manage it before you move on. And by and large, the AORI classification, as you know, is the one that's used. F1 and T1 have intact metaphyseal bone. T2, F2 and T2 have damaged metaphyseal bone, and F3, T3 have deficient metaphyseal bone. And obviously, the management varies depending on the degree of uh, bone loss that is present. Small cavity defects can be filled with, uh, if they're not peripheral, 
Then you can fill them up with bone graft. Peripheral ones also, you can usually fill in with bone cement, or if it's more than five to seven millimeters, you can actually use a screw. And so you can see over here, a, a relatively larger five to seven, 10 millimeter defect filled with a bone screw used as a reinforcement. Bone grafts can be used. For example, you can use a hemi wedge or a morselized graft, or even a solid homograft if you can have uh, access to it. And finally, a structural femoral allograft in rare cases. Sometimes uh, blocks and wedges can be used, and especially this is possible if the defects are more than 10 millimeters or so in height. But if you're going to use a, uh, a block or a wedge, always offset it with a stem. And these are actually are useful in the more, more elderly patients where uh, bone grafts may or may not incorporate depending on the age of the patient and the overall quality of bone. And it, bone block, blocks necessitates removal of some intact tissues so that you can actually fit them appropriately. And they should be combined with Diabetes and a sugar control both of Dr. Rashmi Das, Dr. Rashmi Das, could you please mute your mic? Thank you. Thank you. So when you're using stems, uh, cementless stems are usually preferred. An offset may be used to uh, centralize uh, uh, a stem if required. Femoral stems tend to be longer unless there's a coexisting total hip replacement. Tibial stems tend to be shorter and thicker. What's happened now? Oh. And then uh, in nowadays, uh, we have the luxury of uh, metaphyseal uh, sleeves as well as tantalum augments. And these can actually help us in filling larger metaphyseal defects. And the, you can fill it. The uh, titanium metaphyseal sleeves can also be used for non-contained and irregular defects. And these can be combined again with stems. The key steps then after you've managed the bone loss is to start the reconstruction of the joint itself and balancing the gaps. So let us look at how we actually start. First, you need to establish the tibial platform. So the tibial surface comprises both the flexion and the extension gaps, and it's the natural point of starting reconstruction. And a well-placed intermediary rod usually is very helpful for getting the initial alignment. And contained defects, as we saw, we can fill in with a graft or cement. Uncontained defects can be managed with augments, wedges, or metaphyseal sleeves, or even cones, uh, trabecular metal cones. First, you stabilize the knee in flexion. So the tibial platform is already done. You flex the flexion gap is balanced by the size of the femoral component and the thickness of the tibial insert. And the combination should give the best joint line which should be chosen. The epicondyl axis is usually the best reference point for femoral rotation if they are present. Otherwise, the gaps around the components must be reconstructed with augments as shown in the, in the diagram. The joint line should ideally be between 25 to 30 millimeters distal to the medial femoral epicondyle if it's present. If it's not present, you can actually look at the inferior pole of the patella, which should be above the joint line. And what uh, if that is the, uh, can be cross-checked with the joint line being about a finger's breadth above the head of the fibula. If you're lucky enough to have a remnant of the uh, menisci, this probably is the best way of assessing where the native joint was. So once you've uh, got your flexion gap, you need to balance the extension gap. And the extension gap can be managed with augments, which can reduce the extension gap. And asymmetric bone defects or distal femoral cuts that were cut with the wrong angle originally can be corrected with augments on one side only or a larger augment on one side than compared to the other. And within limits, resecting additional distal femur can enlarge a relatively tight extension gap. So this is very, very uncommon. Finally, if laxity persists despite soft tissue balancing, correction of bony deformities and implant positioning then you have to choose implants of greater constraint. And it's important to understand the difference between uh, instability and constraint. Ligament instability requires that 
the support or constraint should be increased to achieve stability. But how do you decide how much constraint to use? So if you look at the implants of increasing constraint, the cruciate retaining knee, uh, so sacrificing knee is obviously going to be more constrained than your cruciate retaining knee. Next, you come to the, the valgus varus constrained knees. That's like the uh, TC3 or the CCK knees. Then you go on to the rotating hinge. And finally, you get come to the fixed hinges. So finally, you look at the implant that you're going to use and check the ligamentous integrity. If the MCL status is intact, you can actually uh, do a posterior stabilized or a deep dish design. If it's lax, then you uh, can do a, a varus valgus constraint. And finally, if it's absent, then you should consider a hinge. The criteria for using a, a varus valgus constraint is basically if the flexion gap difference is less than the jump height, which is less than 10 millimeters. And joint line restoration must be within 10 millimeters. And reconstruction of the distal AP femur has been possible with some degree of collateral stability being present. So the question that might arise in some uh, younger uh, viewer's mind is why not use hinges all the time? Because they obviously give you the maximum stability. The effect of increasing constraint actually increases stability. But it actually also increases the stress at the implant fixation interface. And this increases the risk of early failure. So constraint must is not balanced. And this actually, if you increase the constraint, you're actually reducing the length of uh, the life of the prosthesis itself. So remember, use trial components for balancing. Spacer blocks are meant for normal bone. The key to the flexion gap is the posterior femoral surface. The key to the extension gap is the distal femoral surface. Instability results more frequently from bone loss than ligament loss, and always go to uh, surgery with constraint components available. Use constraint components infrequently and know when and why you want to use them. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ronan, for this uh, nice uh, overview of uh, uh, the revision um, case. So it, this will be a like a, a base for all the cases. So any questions, uh, sir, Dr. Rajiv, any questions on the platform? Uh, uh, I can think take, uh, one, two questions. Uh, we, we go on with the cases, yes, and then sir. we'll have the discussions on the... Uh, we'll take the discussion topic later. That, uh, so we can take a few, uh, one, two questions after each talk. Uh, then if time permits, we can discuss uh, later on after all the talks are over. I will request next uh, Dr. Mirinal, Dr. Mirinal uh, for presenting on the case of aseptic loosening. Over to Dr. Mirinal. Thank you, Deva. Thank you, IA, for the opportunity. Can you see me? Yes, uh, now. Yeah, so uh, I'll be presenting a case on aseptic loosening. Aseptic loosening is the second most commonest cause of uh, revisions after infection. Uh, earlier, it used to be pretty high and used, used to be the number one uh, cause for revisions, but now it has come down because of the improvements in the poly. So why would knees fail if you don't balance them in mediolateral, uh, you know, soft tissues are not balanced, the gap balance in flexion extension is not good, the bone resections are not in 90 degrees or in the proper positioning, the components are malpositioned, there is instability, there is malalignment. All of this puts additional stress onto the implants, the prosthesis, and the poly, and the poly wears, generating more wear particles. These wear particles, they activate the macrophages, the lymphocytes, and with their you know, interaction, the osteoclastic activity increases, which leads to loosening and increased bone resorption, which later on leads to implant instability. So osteolysis and aseptic loosening are hand in hand. Initial osteolysis leads to loosening, which is called aseptic loosening because there is no infection involved. Usually, the patient will present with a startup pain, recurrent diffusions, and instability if they have aseptic loosening. Preoperative workup is always done to rule out infection because it is aseptic, so there is no sepsis to be involved in these kinds of loosenings. This ESR and CRP should be normal. If you have any doubt, do aspirate. The patient should be off antibiotics. Radiographs, obviously, they tell you about orthoscanogram, about the malalignment and stress fuse, about the instability. CT scans are sometimes helpful in delineating the bone defects. 
and mars mri can tell you about the early loosening so this is the case of aseptic loosening you can see you know uh, subtle loosens is below the tibia on the left side and the ct scans are not able to give us much you know uh, much details about the kind of defects we'll have and see intraoperatively huge femoral defect huge tibial defects which were managed you know with sleeves and this is a five year outcome of the same patient but this is not the case i'm presenting i am presenting this patient 74 year female who had a bmi of 36 you know and the index surgery was done 8 years ago and probably you can see the tibia going into varus collapse which is commonly seen in such patients and they come with pain difficulty walking esr crp were normal and no signs of infection were there you can see that the tibia on the medial side is depressed i have removed the tibial component and you can see huge type 2a anderson ori defect on the medial tibial condyle and that uh, you know that when the tissues are cleared you know you see that the defects are even bigger than what you contemplate on the x rays i usually use sleeves to build up these defects this is how i am preparing for the sleeve and the sleep preparation was done in gradually decreasing sizes after that i remove the femoral component i sometimes use giggly saws and also you know thin saw blades and osteotomes to remove the femoral component with minimal bone loss the trial was done with the trial components and these are the final components with the tibial sleeve and a tc3 constraint implant was used now we need to restore the joint line you can still see that there is a huge defect medially but the lateral side the tibial component is sitting on the tibia so joint and restoration has already been discussed and these are the three four things which you can use the medial epicondyle the lateral epicondyle tibial tuberosity and also the residual meniscus these are the final component placement and flexion extension balancing is being done and you can see the uh, mbt tray and the rotating tibial insert this is the final outcome of the patient and you can see the three uh, the range of motion at 3 months the same patient at 2 years follow up and she is doing pretty fine so aseptic loosening usually you, you will have to build up the defects take a good history so that you know that it's actually not infection and asepsis pre operative workup must include x ray ct scans and infection rule out you need to build up bone defects using you know augments uh, sleeves and some people also uh, use cones must restore the joint line so that you have a good biomechanics and patellofemoral tracking must achieve a balanced flexion extension gap you will always need to increase the level of constraint one layer one level up like from a ps to a valgus valgus uh, varus constraint or to a hinge and then you might get a balanced stable implant for longevity thank you so that was the case uh, and the final outcome thank you thank you amrinal for the nice and uh, crisp uh, presentation so uh, any questions in the chat box if there is nothing one question just uh, uh, which uh, comes to in aseptic uh, loosening what you should do to rule out uh, if uh, infection is uh, there or not when you diagnose a case of aseptic loosening uh, what pre operative or intra op anything you do to rule out uh, uh, infection I i would usually go with the clinical examination uh, if the knee is quiescent or not then the esr crp if they are uh, within range i would uh, be you know almost certain that this is aseptic but if i have if i have an out of doubt i would do aspirate the joint and then rule out infection and intraoperatively also you can send samples uh, where you can you know see whether the neutrophils are more than 5 in more than 5 hour 5 high power fields so all these things you can rule out infection if on table you have a doubt i think you should go into a two stage revision in such cases so on table uh, uh, Jeeva, can i can i give a small comment here yeah, yes uh, uh, pranal you very rightly mentioned and we must mention here that whenever you are going for a revision even when you are sure that it's a aseptic uh, uh, loosening we must send the implant wash uh, for uh, four or five or six uh, Uh, cultures and this culture should be followed for a period of two weeks uh, as a principle because many a times you will have a you will think that it's a aseptic loosening but uh, some bacteria can grow we will be discussing in further cases sure prinal i have a question for you yes sir yeah so uh, i think we should also think about preventing these problems one was the solution so do you think uh, Uh, how many of the panel people feel that a primary stem should have been put in in this patient in the beginning itself i do agree to that she had a high bmi 
and probably that is the reason for a failure. Uh, I didn't have the immediate post-op X-rays in this case, but uh, uh, over a period of time, just in eight years, she has failed, and that is probably because of uh, the high BMI, excess medial loading that she is getting this uh, high poly wear and leading leading to aseptic loosening. Uh, so stem should be used in BMI more than thirty-five. No, in yeah. fact, uh, uh, now uh, the trend is to actually put in more cement as well into the uh, holes, down the plug hole, so to speak. I mean, in the last couple of meetings that we've attended, uh, in fact, Dr. Dave Barrett from uh, Southampton has actually shown that a thicker, uh, use of a thicker uh, mantle of cement on the tibial interface gives you much better pressurization, much better uh, interlock. And uh, we shouldn't think about uh, having to revise these uh, knees, but rather to spread the stress more evenly. So uh, uh, even in cases where you're not using a stem, you should be using a thicker wad of cement when you're doing a primary TKR on the tibial side, especially. Yeah, very, very right, Ronan. Uh, it is like the, the way you are cementing a, a femoral stem. Uh, similarly, you must cement the tibial uh, stem. Very, very right comment, actually. Uh, and one more, more comment on this, uh, Mridal, that when you have a high BMI patient, probably the stability is more important and avoiding the virus placement of the uh, virus tibial cut is probably two, these are the two most important issues. That the joint has to be stable and tibial cut, uh, you should avoid having the, the virus. So if we use a stem, which is an uncemented stem, it will automatically get you the neutral alignment of the tibia and also give additional support in the obese patient. So that is what is recommended. I think uh, we should, uh, in aseptic loosening also, we should go for frozen tissue biopsy for knowing the neutrophil count so that we definitely rule out infection before going for the... Yeah, that is what I told you intraoperatively. You should yeah, yeah. at least. That is, that is. Yeah. The Deba, we can go for the next case. Yeah, yeah. We'll go for the next case. Uh, if uh, Dr. Subransu Mandi has joined, if he's ready, we can go ahead with uh, his talk on division in infection. Dr. Subransu, are you ready? Subransu? Uh, yes. Maybe we, we can take up the next one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then Dr. Pradeep. Dr. Pradeep, uh, you can uh, speak on uh, your stiff knee revision. Okay. Um, can you see my slide now? Yeah, yeah. it's nice. Yes. Okay. Um, right. So what I'll be talking about is on stiff knees. And by definition, following TKR, actually anything that's less than 90 degree can be considered stiff. So I've got a very straightforward, nothing non-complicated um, case. The 65-year-old lady, one year post bilateral knee replacement done elsewhere. She's come to me because she's unhappy with her left knee, which has got a range of movement from 5 to 70. But because of that, she's not able to climb steps properly, manage uh, slopes or get up from sitting. So now, how do I manage this case? Like, do I do MUA? Do I do arthrolysis? Do I revise? If I revise, how do I revise this? These are the x-rays that he had. He's got a CR on the left knee, which is the one that's stiff. And he's got a PS on the right, which has also got a range of movement of about 90. So how do I go about doing this? First of all, you know, we want to investigate and we want to see what could be the causes for the stiffness. Now, this particular patient had a reasonable range of movement, according to the patient. And she was not really obese. And this is not a rheumatoid case. This is the usual preoperative causes then sometimes it might be a per op case. So how do you investigate? Because you have no idea what has been done during the time of surgery. So, okay, we took this long limb, looked at uh, x-ray, looked at the alignment, looks pretty okay. Joint line seems to be all right. Now rotation, rotation is actually a major cause for pain and limitation. So how do you assess that? So when you're assessing stiffness, you always need to take the CT scan, hip, knee, and ankle, specifically look at the hip, looking at both the tibial rotation and the femoral rotation. And in this case, everything seemed to be all right. The next thing you look at the patella. Now, this particular patient's patella was not replaced, but patella overstuffing is a very common cause 
for stiffness, and that's something that you really need to assess again on the CT. Now, gap balancing, obviously, I, I, I couldn't sort of figure out whether they put in too big an insert or not. I'm not sure. But the sizing seemed okay on the lateral view. So basically, now we're looking at, you know, what was the pain, post-op pain control probably was good as what the patient says. Says he had adequate physiotherapy. I did the CRPSR. There was no effusion. So infection did not seem to be there. So it seemed to be like a case of idiopathic arthrofibrosis on the left knee. Now, how do I approach this? What should I do at this stage for this patient to improve this patient? Should I do uh, arthrolysis? Should I do a revision? So looking at the literature, basically what they say is that if they come for the first three months, probably physiotherapy and MUA is probably the first thing that you need to do. The most important thing being actually pain relief following the surgery. And in fact, what they say is that arthroscopy and MUA probably give you with this almost the same results within the first three months. But after three months, MUA is probably not as good. You probably will need to do an arthrolysis. Now, arthrolysis now, okay, this is now one year down the line. Do I do it open? Do I do it arthroscopic? See, I, I thought the advantages of open is that, you know, you can get a good access to the posterior part, change the line of required, you know, a lot of things there. But when you actually look at the literature, what it shows is that arthroscopic arthrolysis actually gives a much better range of movement following the for the following the arthrolysis. Even this uh, uh, series by uh, Fitzsimmons, they too seem to say that open arthrolysis was not as impressive as the arthroscopic one. Probably a stiffness following the surgery, second surgery is much more. But arthroscopic arthrolysis seems to be the way to go, at least in the initial stage. This is other results which come from arthroscopic arthrolysis. Yeah, this is done at six months. They improved on an average by about 35 degrees. Another paper by in 2014, again, an average of 35 degrees. But all of them seem to suggest that the final range of movement is not as good as what you would initially get per ops. And that's something that we need to warn these patients. But always the question is, now, do I do a revision for this patient or should I do an arthrolysis now for this patient? Now, literature seems to suggest that for most cases, it's probably if you're not on a primary arthroscopy, you probably would be better to do it, especially within the first six months. The only time when you may consider doing a, a revision primarily probably will be mainly in malrotated implants or if there's patella stuffing of their patella problems. There's a lot of literature to suggest that. Now, what about um, you know, revisions itself for the stiffness when you don't have anything else really? Now, if you look at Douglas Dennis's results for the stiff knees, he had about 50 of them and he looked at them. And mind you, most of them were actually problems with rotation and stuffing of the patella. Almost 50% were just that. And only about 10% was not identified. Now, look at his results. This is for the stiffness. They improved from 88 to 103. Only about 15 degrees he got with a revision. Most of these patients, by the way, had an arthrolysis by an arthroscopic procedure earlier. But even after the revision, that is all the range of movement that they got with a 28% complication rate. Doesn't look like revision is really providing you much of range of movement. What's even worse was this particular uh, paper, which says that if you got an idiopathic stiff knee with no malrotation, et cetera, the results are even worse than what you would get, like than what uh, Dennis Douglas got. So that sounds even worse which is what my patient was, right? Now, there's actually only, uh, you know, this paper by William Maloney and Stewart, what he says is, look, if you're going to be going ahead with a revision following the arthroscopy, you need to go it step by step. You do an extensive arthrolysis, you know, debridement, um, all this car management, et cetera. You look at the insert, you can try and see if you can lower the size of the insert uh, and see if that improves your range of movement. If necessary, like there's a lot, lot of literature as to whether, you know, you should just change your uh, femoral insert, say, from a CR to a PS and try and see if that alone changes or do you have to revise both components. Again, whatever you do, the results do not seem to be very good. And in fact, um, this paper by Bellman, see, he is looking at the other extreme. He's not looking just as a single component revision. He's looking at a hinged knee versus a CCK revision. And he's looking at the outcome of these for a revision for a stiff knee. And what he showed is that it is the hinge knee which actually gives you a probably a better 
result if you're doing it for a stiff knee. The stiff knee may be because of a malrotated implant or maybe because of arthrofibrosis. But the th thing is that it's a hinge knee which probably gives you a better result than a CCK, probably because you can do a better debridement. There have been literature with you know using less lesser constraints, chaining of inserts, etc. But all of them do not seem to be giving you good results. Now coming back to my patient, what do I do for this patient? This patient's one year down the line, has got a limited range of movement. Do I do revision? Do I do an arthrolysis with arthroscopic? I think what I need to do to for this patient is probably offer her an arthroscopic arthrolysis. From literature, I may get up somewhere between 20 and 25 degrees of range of movement, get her knee to about at least 90 degrees of flexion, which will probably give a much better function. If that doesn't work, then I may have, I don't know whether I would provide, I would offer her uh, revision. And if I have to offer her revision, if she's still adamant, probably the only thing I may be able to give her is a hinged. Is it or is it not? I'm not sure, but the key thing probably is that you need good pain relief and physiotherapy even after your arthrolysis. The outcome of revision surgery is not very good when you're considering it for stiffness. So in summary, if you catch them early, MUA is probably the way to go. Afterwards, probably you can try an arthroscopic debridement over an open debridement. If that fails, remember revision is not all that very great even in malrotated and other implants. It does give you some better range of movement, but uh, uh, reserve its use very judiciously. Revise only for very stiff knees and if you can definitely identify something. For an idiopathic arthrofibrosis, might have to be a little careful. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, Pradeep. I, I think it's a very, very interesting and important subject and you do a knee replacement and you end up having a stiff knee. Uh, Pradeep, I'll just uh, uh, start the ball rolling on this uh, uh, with your mention of the reducing the size of the poly. Uh, my uh, take is that if you have a fixed flexion deformity of say 10, 15 degrees, then probably you are sure that the, uh, that the uh, patient, the extension space and the flexion space, both are stuffed up. Uh, do you agree with this, that uh, uh, otherwise just reducing the size of the poly uh, may end up having giving the, uh, rather the uh, flexion instability? See, there are a lot of papers which actually just look at changing of the insert alone, and they don't seem that, uh, to have all that very good results. The whole thing was the idea in changing the size of the insert. One is that you remove the insert, you can take out all the posterior, clean out the posterior part. If there's posterior additions, you can clean it up. All that will actually help in getting your extension as well. Uh, but, you know, changing the insert alone does not, uh, did not seem to have the required results in terms of stiff. Yeah. Yeah. So though we think it might, you know, produce all that in stiff knees, it, just an insert change did not seem to give you the kind of results that one would require. There's lots more than just simply a mechanical uh, change of an insert. It's a lot more than just that. In the same continuity, do you agree that the larger femorals, femoral component is probably most of the times the reason? Because if, the, if you use a larger uh, femoral component, it will uh, stuff up the uh, flexion gap. Definitely. I and mean, if it is shifted uh, uh, anteriorly, it will stuff up the, uh, the patellofemoral joint as well. That's right. You know, definitely the size of the implant matters, which is why I said you have to look at the various uh, things that might affect the surgery. So things like malalignment, uh, malrotation. These were the uh, malrotation was probably the most common thing that was caused the stiffness. And that is the one that was best relieved by revision. Second most common thing that caused uh, the stiffness was patella stuffing. And that can be by either using too thick an implant uh, the femur size or two thicker patella implant. These were the two most common technical reasons why there was stiffness. I mean, mal malalignment and other things were also there, joint line changes, all those things were there, but they were much less common when you're considering the causes for a stiff joint. Rajiv, can you please uh, uh, tell for the juniors, uh, how do you go ahead with the MUA? Within the three months period, if you get a stiff knee, how to how do you go go and how you um, approach a case of stiff knee within sure. three months? 
Now, I mean, obviously, uh, you have to sort of see what the range of movement is pre-op. And uh, the, what usually gets stuck is the petala. That's the one that gets, usually gets stuck. So petala mobilization is very, very important. You would first try a, few, a week or so preoperatively itself to try and get that range of movement with physiotherapy and good pain control before you actually take them up for anesthesia. Having failed your normal conservative uh, methods, non-operative methods, you may have to take them into theater. Again, in theater is mainly mobilization of the patellofemoral part and uh, manipulation and anesthesia should be gentle, should not be too forced, because if you do that, there's a high chance that there can be a fracture or some sort of extensive rupture. What is probably more important than just the MUA is the pain relief that you give after the surgery. Very often, what I've seen is that, you know, giving, for example, a adductor canal catheter for up to five to seven days following the MUA is probably equally important, probably more important than just the MUA. Brinal, you I tend to... to agree entirely. In fact, uh, if you look at it, there are two ma major things that we need to look at. One is the factors contributing it to the uh, arthrofibrosis in the first place, which is what Pradeep just highlighted. The second thing is that it's the timing of the uh, procedure that is uh, most important. Because if you try and go in late, by that time, the fibrosis is actually well organized. And, and you can see that the results of uh, the, the revision surgeries, the results of uh, poly exchange are all very poor because the soft tissues are already contracted and uh, the chances of getting a good result are obviously diminished after six months to a year. So I think prevention is probably better than cure and pain control after primary knee replacement is possibly one of the most important factors to ensure that uh, patients don't get primary arthrofibrosis. In fact, uh, in general, it's a good idea to tell your physiotherapist that if a patient is not getting about 90 degrees by about two weeks, they should bring the patient for an urgent review so you can actually see if there's anything else going wrong if the patient is actually doing his or her exercises appropriately, rather than waiting for you know a month or six weeks for the patient to come back. So I think uh, training your physiotherapist to pick these up early also helps. Yeah, Mrinal, you have a question? Yeah. I just I just wanted to add one thing. Majority of these they come within thirty to sixty degrees of uh, contractures, hmm. and that is the range of motion they have. And usually, intraoperatively, uh, sometimes a quadriceps snip helps you in exposure. But if you are changing just one component, I have found I have found out that it does not do, do the job properly. You have to change usually both the components just by changing poly or by releasing. You're not able to get the proper flexion extension gap. That is what I have uh, seen in my experience in three, four cases I've done for arthrofibrosis. I think what you mean yeah, is no, and rightly so, that uh, you must assess the patient well and all the reasons which may be contributing towards the, uh, the stiffness uh, should be dealt with. Um, uh, Pradeep. Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that, you know, uh, whatever you do, the outcome is quite uh, is not all that great, which is why they are going to the extent of saying that probably hinge knees is probably the uh, one which will give you a range of movement. You will probably get better range of movement using uh, the LCCK or whatever other type of implants that you use. But always remember that revision surgery for a stiff knee for range of movement is not all that very great. Try and prevent it before it reaches that stage. Thank you, Pradeep. Very right. I think for the younger yeah. surgeons, the pain management is very important, right? Size of the femoral component and ensuring that the flexion and extension gaps are not overstuffed. And also ensure that your posture offset is also maintained. Uh, Deva, we can go to the next case now. Uh, Dr. Mahanti, are you ready now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you can uh, just, see your screen. I'm sitting in the airport and... Uh, <laughs> nice background. Well, good. You are at the airport these days. We understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just share my screen. Please. Am I audible and visible? Uh, yes. Hello. Okay. Okay. So, good evening, dear friends. Uh, thanks, uh, Deva and uh, Dr. Sharma and Dr. 
Ronan Roy for giving me this opportunity. So I'll present a case of chronic infected dislocated uh, TKR. So here is my patient who is a 66 year old female, a polyarticular rheumatoid, underwent bilateral stage total knee replacement in 1998. The left knee got infected in 2002, probably following some dental space sepsis. Hence, a debridement was done in 2002, but patient collapsed during surgery. She could be revived. And uh, this was uh, some of the x-rays in 2010. The x-ray looks pretty well fixed. But uh, then uh, she had a recurrence of the infection. She had a persistent discharging sinus. There is a swelling, gross instability when she presented to me. The, she was not able to walk. Only twice a year aspiration was done for the last 15 years. So she presented me to in 2017. Uh, and uh, at that time she was bedridden, wheelchair bound and was advised amputation. This was the clinical status. There was a discharging sinus uh, there. Sometimes the discharge was coming. There's a ballooning of the you know, knee joint. And uh, this was the x-rays with gross osteoporosis, dislocated knee with osteomyelitis and reactions on the femur. And uh, that was the situation. So what to do? Any suggestions? Anybody? Renal? Hello? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, uh, able to hear you yes, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Shubhranchu, maybe you complete your case and then we have a discussion. Okay, no problem. So, I discussed with the patient and relatives. Since he was advised amputation, I told them that I'll take a trial, but I cannot guarantee you on the table, I may require amputation as well. So, I took a computer, you know, uh, took a consent for amputation. Because lest it may get, uh, while taking out the implants, everything, suppose it gets communicated, everything, and you don't have anything such as osteoporotic bone. So I took a consent for amputation, and I told I'll try to take it out and uh, put a cement spacer. Now, I decided to put a monoblock spacer, because monoblock spacers are indicated when the knee is grossly unstable, and number two, when there is a severe gap, maybe more than three to four centimeter gap if it is present uh, between tibia and uh, you know femoral surfaces, then monoblock spacer is indicated. So this is how I took out the implant. Uh, this was a lot of cement was there in the implant. This was the earlier uh, type of, you know, uh, I think how medica striker, how medica prosthesis. Uh, that time it was used very commonly in 1998. And after taking it out, uh, then I prepared uh, two cement dowels like this. This is using 5cc syringes. He has got a white canal because of osteoporosis. And uh, so in order to give stability to that monoblock spacers, I prepared two, two 5cc syringes, cut the ends, and put k wires inside and uh, put antibiotic imprint cement inside. Then I cut both the syringes and these are the two dowels were ready for insertion inside the intramedullary canal. I also used uh, the stimulan, uh, you know, granules there. So I put intramedullary stimulan inside the femur, inside the tibia, and then these two dowels, one on the femoral side, one on the tibial side, keeping this k wires projected like that. Then gave traction. And this is a gel foam which has been uh, put uh, posteriorly in order to protect the soft tissue structures, the neurovascular bundles which are there posteriorly. Then mixed another three packets of cement and filled the canal as well as the around that, uh, you know, to give stability to that and held it in that thing in position. That is how the post-operative X-ray looks like. Uh, there is intramedullary stimulant as well as the, the cement dowels along with a static spacer some stimulant was put on the posterior aspect of the joint as well. Then immediately post-operative period, I could make the patient stand. She has got deformed feet as well as the hands, so it was difficult to mobilize because she was immobilized for such a you know, long period of around 15 years. 
So the reported disadvantage of a monoblock spacer is there is restriction of joint motion during the interim period. There is severe adhesions of the suprapartular recesses as well as the parapartular gutter. So while doing a second stage, there's a possibility that uh, you know you have to do a lot of release because uh, you're unable to you know create the parapartular gutters. There is shortening of the quadriceps tendon because knee remains in extension. And 60% of patients, they have got either tibial or femoral bone loss. That is what is reported in the literature because when the patient starts to walk, there will be a lot of bone loss maybe encountered. So this is the literature shows what are the antibiotics to be added. Tobra, you know, Banco, uh, Genta, these are the antibiotics can be added. We prefer to add Vancomycin 4 grams plus uh, Gentamycin in pre-mixed, uh, you know, so 40 gram palaka cement, I add 4 grams of vancomycin. This calcium sulfate pellets, we put it in intramedullary. This is, of course, another patient, not the same patient. This is how the, you know, calcium sulfate pellets can be introduced into the intramedullary canal that takes care of the intramedullary infection. And normally, you know, 10 gram of uh, this calcium sulfate pellets are, you know, stimulant. We add one gram of vancomycin and uh, gentamycin, 80 milligrams. But they recommend you can put uh, around 200 or 240 milligrams of gentamycin and two grams of vancomycin in 10 grams of uh, uh, this calcium sulfate cement pellets. But be careful not to put uh, in the superficial structure, superficial to the quadriceps tendon, because that may lead to sterile discharge during the post-operative period. And uh, of course, that heals with uh, dressing, but that always confuses with the recurrence of the infection. So always put with the calcium sulfate pellets uh, in the inside the intramedullary canal, in the suprapatlar pouch and in the parapatlar gutters. So the patient was mobilized afterwards. And now this is almost, I think, six years uh, follow-up of this patient. Those are the X-ray, but uh, the entirely the sinus, everything has healed. She's able to do active SLR to a certain extent like this. And uh, she's mobilized with a knee brace uh, like this. Of course, these are the special kind of footwear which has uh, been designed for her because she's a rheumatoid lady. But uh, though ESR CRP is normal, I put her on a little long-term antibiotic prophylaxis for about two years after the surgery orally. And later on, I stopped the antibiotics, uh, but the cement spacers are holding well and uh, she's reluctant to undergo a second stage surgery. And she's being mobilized uh, with that, uh, working with a walker and attending social functions as well. The reinfection rate, which, uh, you know, Mark Pearson, uh, Emerson has described in the literature, the reinfection rate depends more on the time elapsed rather than the surgical techniques. So if you see the four years, you know, six years, seven years reinfection rate, the 12 years reinfection rate is almost 30% in a static uh, spacer. That is what uh, they have shown. I acknowledge that Dr. Sanjay Agrawal and Dr. Pachare for sending me this case. Happiness has come back to the family and for me the satisfaction. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. And uh, hereby, I again, uh, you know, Put forth my humble request for all the members of the IOA who are present here uh, for their support in my endeavor for the vice president uh, election of Indian Orthopedic Association, which is, will be online in uh, November this year. And uh, please uh, extend your kind support. Thank you for a patient hearing. Now we can discuss about the case. Uh, thank you, Shubhranchu. Uh, the one thing, Shubhranchu, Ranju, that is very, uh, very interesting. This case is that she is a case of bilateral total knee replacement. Yeah. One knee is badly infected, so much so that you had considered uh, even the uh, level of amputation. Yeah. Uh, while the other knee remained uh, uh, non infected. Right. And that is quite a few cases that we see that one knee is infected, so it is not necessary that the other knee will also uh, necessarily be infected. Uh, if one is infected. But whenever... That's, one a, thing, that's one very important observation. But uh, one must, you know, remember that uh, if uh, one knee is infected, suppose the other knee you have not done, would you like to do the other knee before addressing the infected knee? I would not. Uh, no, in a, in a uh, I would first already the infected, infected knee, joint... Then go with the... 
So what what yeah. uh, Shubhranshu you are asking is that one knee is infected under treatment yeah. for infection. Should you yeah. go for the second knee surgery? Yeah. That's what is your question. Knee, suppose arthritic yeah. and uh, it requires a knee replacement. Uh, right. I, I have faced uh, this uh, in situation. Ronan, many you like times. to answer this? Answer what? Sorry. Uh, Shubhranshu's question that one knee is infected, patient is having arthritis on the other knee. Would you simultaneously operate the second knee also? I'd be very conservative to be very worried. I'd be worried. Because, I mean, if there's a flare and bacteremia at any time, you're going to put the second knee at risk as well. So I wouldn't like to operate in a patient who has a pre-existing infection. No. Any any differing opinion uh, amongst the panel, Mandal? So, no, no, I am not differing with the opinion. I just... Uh... I totally agree to what is being discussed that the infection in one knee needs to be cured and the bacteremia and the right. infection in the whole body needs to go before you do touch the other knee. That should be... Rakesh? Yeah. Uh, no, Rajiv. Um, in this case, I'm generally quite aggressive, but not in this case. Here, uh, the infection has to be settled because by the time uh, you do the right man, right. you throw a lot of bacteria. Uh, Ut Uttam and Pradeep, uh, would you agree with what Ronan has said? Yeah, I mean, if, when you're worried about even a urinary tract infection or a dental infection before you do a TKR, why would you not be worried about an infected TKR? So, so uh, I think, Shubhranchu, here, all of us are of the same opinion that, yes, no, in yeah. such a case, you better treat the infection first. And I think you gave a very right uh, message to the younger, younger surgeons. Yesterday, 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 I saw a patient who was, of course, a hip infection, not a knee infection. It's a chronic hip infection. And uh, his other hip is very much, you know, arthritic, vascular necrosis. And he was insisting me that first get this other hip done because the infected yeah. hip is not very painful. But uh, very, I very think right. the message is that one should never do the, you know, other hip and uh, lest it may get infected. So one right. should always address the problematic or infected side first before addressing the other hip. Okay. Yeah, Uttam, you uh, wanted to tell something. Yeah. 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 Then last answer from Uttam, and then we go on to the next case. Yes. I, I just want a, uh, want a one uh, question to uh, the Dr. Mahanti. Uh, sir, for a long term, uh, the cement spacer will look uh, is, is will be uh, act as a foreign body reaction. Yeah, true. Now, so so it's a five six year now. I think you have some. Huh? Yeah. So it will it will act as a foreign body now, and it will again in fact. So yeah. It, either it has to be replaced, and it will be arthritis. It it is the best treatment, or it to be the revision stand. Oh, revision surgery. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I have already suggested uh, them that yeah. you should go ahead with the second stage and uh, keeping again uh, the chance of infection high. But the family is not agreeing, neither the patient nor the family are agreeing. Yeah, we understand when patient they are has gone, following up. gone so They are much. regularly following up for their uh, knee, right. but uh, they are not agreeing for second uh, surgery. Deba, we we'll go on to the so next we'll case. We will go ahead. One more point will be that uh, static spacer, as uh, Sir was mentioned from literature, should be avoided as much as possible. Uh, more of uh, these modular things will be needed. So we will go ahead. Uh, the next talk uh, will be uh, by uh, Dr. Rakesh Rajput. He will be speaking on revision in extensor mechanism rupture, his case based presentation. Rajesh. There is a question in the audience that uh, Dr. Anupam Srivast, the maximum limit to keep spacers. The, uh, uh, this varies from surgeon to surgeon. Can we have a little discussion on this? Uh, 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 Shubranchu, we can have it at the end of the session. End of the session. Okay. I keep for about uh, you know six weeks to eight weeks maximum. Then go ahead with the second stage, or else I revise the special. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhash. Shall we go ahead, uh, Rajiv? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, so um, I'm going to present uh, what I feel is an interesting case. I'm sure others have also gone through this. Um, the consensus is like if you know beforehand that you don't have an extensor mechanism, uh, would anybody do a um, revision TKR? Just for a raise of hands, uh, or anybody from the panel, would would you do if you know beforehand? No. So, uh, yeah, one of the if a patient has got a patellectomy, for example, yeah. no, not patellectomy, extensor mechanism, uh, either disruption or absence. 
not pat like to me pat no i think uh, my answer don't have the pat like has to be uh, reconstructed yeah. before uh, planning the replacement if such a there case. is no extensive mechanism it needs to be orthodized and not replaced yeah, yeah. so that's our general consensus so in that view i think this is a bit interesting so this is how i got this patient uh, she is a 62 year old uh, presenting with increasing pain and swelling in her left knee she's had a bilateral uh, dkr done 4 years back the left knee never felt right to her but she was managing uh, but for last 4 months i think it's become unmanageable now and uh, she's been going to her previous uh, surgeon who kept on like uh, you know uh, you know what happens you know so they went on going on and on and on but she never got better um she is diabetic she is hypothyroid hypertensive and uh, borderline ckd it's not like terrible creatinine but she is like 1.6 creatinine so when we got her like the knee was swollen warm diffusely tender and she is again a stiff knee uh, so we can discuss that issues also crp high esr high uh, aspirate uh, nothing grown uh, so you know everything pointing towards an infection no sinus but that's her uh, presenting x ray uh, unfortunately all her previous x rays been taken up by insurance so we don't have any and in interim period she had gone away for two years so no x rays were done so this is how she presents and i think if you look at the x ray uh, i think you can see the whole failing tbl component it has tilted the medial side there is almost overhang now um, and uh, she's uh, done a periprosthetic fracture on the tbl side also there is bone loss happening on the femoral side also you can see like the femoral component loosening up so you get a, a patient like this where you now have uh, a uh, septic loosening so how do we go about this um, you know standard fashion i won't go about so here we have done everything uh, what needs to be done and we put an articulating spacer we have bypassed that uh, small area of periprosthetic fracture also uh, with the spacers and uh, we let her mobilize and all that it's only when she uh, you know presented to us uh, about and uh, so she took a bit while to actually get her crp down it wasn't down in 6 weeks itself but in about 2 months time it was down so there was this question being asked as to how much you should wait uh, for uh, you know before you change and i think actually the longer you wait it's better and the longer period it crp and all that remains good but as long as what you put in is actually functioning you shouldn't see bone necrosis happening or the spaces coming loose if they are functioning fine i think it's better to wait uh, in fact as long as you want so uh, here we are now about two months time but the patient here in this case is very desperate to get a second stage done so here we sort of see this uh, point still here so we go in we start sort of you know revising on our exposure we realize that uh, you know a lot of our tibial debrosity is now actually missing but there was a small fiber of attachment of the patellar tendon just on the lateral aspect so we went at did all our preparations you know we had to use an offset uh, you know tbi in this one got her gap balance as what uh, dr ronin has just explained so then you come and you do extension gaps but at this stage we realized that you know the a couple of times we've done trials and everything that whatever that remnant of uh, tissue which we had on the lateral aspect the distal attachment to the tibia is also now off completely so you can see a huge defect uh, and you can see the whole stem actually visible on proximally uh, i have this uh, nakey feeling of doing every time uh, cm pictures i always do at least one shot cm pictures to make sure i don't have any more periprosthetic cracks around here you can see the whole cement being fixed uh, and we have used the raised platform also as dr ronin was saying that you need to lift your tibia up so if you're not using um, the um, the cones or sleeves you need to use the uh, added uh, extra stem uh, so that you bring up and use lesser of a poly so here you see the defect uh, which is happening and you can now see that uh, we are luck stuck we don't have a patellar tendon at all so what do we do we we do have a tendon remnant of it but we don't have any bone to actually reattach it back so uh, you know you get hold of one of your uh, colleagues who's a very good um, uh so this thing um soft tissue surgeon and you start getting your grafts in so here we have taken a semi tendinosus we have taken a, a, the the gracilis also also a small sliver of uh, quadriceps and use in fiber tape so all those four things were used because it is not easy to replace the patellar tendon just by hamstring so you need to actually supplement a lot more ideally in an ideal world if you know from beforehand i think you can get hold of now 
cadaveric uh, grafts, the uh, the patella grafts, or even Achilles tendon, which you can actually reverse and put it here. But if you're on table, you're stuck like this or a partial ruptures you have, this is a, a bailout technique for you. So with a lot of trepidation, I use suture anchors. And I think you can just see the final preparations being done here. And that's being the whole uh, tightening of these anchors. I'll just show you the post-op access. If you see the lateral view, we've actually used anchors to tie up and bring this whole stuff on the middle aspect. Otherwise, there was just no way to reattach this tendon there. So we were also very apprehensive that whether we'll get hold of, uh, you know, uh, any uh, semblance of normality to her. But luckily, this is three months down the line here. You see, she has a bit of lurch, grade four quadriceps power, but she is independently mobile. She is now reaching six months, still doing very well. But uh, every time I feel, I don't know what's going to happen with this uh, patella tendon, what we have just reconstructed. So that's my short case. Um, thank you very much. Happy thank to take you. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, actually, uh, I want to know from the panel uh, uh, about the gastro flag for these type of cases, which uh, can uh, put on the defect of patella tendon, which can help in uh, extension and uh, recovery of these patients. And also flap cover helps in coverage of the area with, uh, of defect. So any, any anyone? But uh, Deva, before you go ahead, uh, I'd like to just suggest uh, Rakesh in retrospect, when you did the first stage of the revision, would you have done a TTO to try and preserve the patella tendon uh, during the first stage? That is one thing that, I mean, would you have done something differently is the question. The, if you see, Ron, in the uh, first X-ray which I showed you, there was actually a crack happening just where uh, the tibial tuberosis are just lateral to it. So it, the TTO would have been a bit risky for me to go ahead because otherwise that TTO probably wouldn't have healed actually that area because that whole area was terminated. Remember, she is a rheumatoid, very osteoporotic bone. I would have been a bit worried. I would rather leave the attachment. It wasn't too bad, patella tendon. Uh, some of it was missing even in the primary surgery because we had to debride that bone from infection. But there was enough patella tendon not to worry so much. It's only when we came back for the revision that we realized that it's now missing. Um, One more question. In continuation with what uh, uh, Deva has asked, uh, when yes. you close this uh, this wound, were you right. able to have a good closure? Yeah, the, so uh, the Rajinji, apart from because the gastronemius flap uh, does help you in giving a good coverage to the implant. I, I agree. Uh, but here, you know, when you don't have a skin cover uh, or a soft tissue cover, we have an adequate cover though. I didn't show you the whole right. picture. Once we reconstruct right. it, we actually can get but it's just the bottom bit, which isn't there. So my problem is actually, I don't have uh, a soft tissue attachment from patella tendon to the tibia. So there the gastrocnemius flap is not going to help me. That won't give me the dynamic uh, movements or the control of movements. And once we've attached these uh, ligaments, then actually bringing, it doesn't make sense because uh, then I won't get a skin cover if I bring a gastrocnemius flap because that will make my whole thing. Then I have to bring a skin graft also on top of it. That is just no, you have very rightly mentioned that this is the one of the most difficult situations for, for any replacement. Uh, just the one, one uh, bit about <coughs> the uh, have you considered using the peroneus brevis or peroneus longus? Yeah, so if you're that also could be a good alternative, absolutely. So, uh, because we have four things here you see, we have semitendinosus, we have gracilis, a uh, cordyceps uh, tendon, uh, and the fiber tape. So if hmm. I did not have semitendinous and gracilis, maybe the peronis would have been the next option. Hmm. And a question, question Can is I just that, add uh, something? Uh, question no, no. is that whether you will go for a hinge knee for a, in this kind of cases. Is hinge knee is an indication for extensor mechanism deficiency or you go for a routine, you know, your uh, constant knee, PC3 or LCCK? So I think if your patella tendon is deficient, then... Uh, the rotating hinge also going to be difficult. Then you might have to think about fixed hinges. Uh, but, um, you know, that will have other problems uh, with it. So we realized this, you know, when, uh, at the time when we had already almost fixed the components. It's just the final trial when we were doing the whole, uh, the, uh, whatever little uh, remnant of the peritone was at that disappeared. Till that time I had in my mind that I have to reconstruct this tendon a bit more. But the whole final shot, the whole thing disappeared. Okay, uh, last question from Mirnal. The yeah. yeah. experience of the panel on using uh, hernia mesh or artificial ligaments or grafts or yeah. maybe, the, you know, allograft, petal tendon allografts. Any experience anyone has? 
Yeah, can I just say something? I think, you know, for the, this is a case of patellar tendon rupture, really speaking. And for that, very often there's the uh, there are remnants of tissue there. It's not like it's just left open there. And the graft, like what Rakesh has used, is a very useful thing. But to detension that graft, because otherwise all the tension is just on the graft. To detension it, you can have two options. One is to use the SS wire, like, you know, through the petala and through the tibial tuberosity to detension it while the graft sort of takes place. The other thing is to use fiber tape instead of the SS wire, which is what is nowadays being used. So they do not have to go back for another surgery to remove the SS wire. The second thing is that, for, that we have had actually published also cases where we have had open patients coming with an open knee where the petala tendon is completely gone, infected. So we've actually debrided and we use a gastroc flap over that area to bridge the deficiency and we're published on that. Patients have got reasonable function. They do have a lag. It's not that they do not have a lag. So gastrocnemia is flaps or whatever flap you, you use does provide the patient stability, but they do have a lag with that. As far as the LAS are concerned, yes, LAS are, are available. I don't know whether they're available here in India, have used them, but they also use, can, the same thing can be used also for the quadriceps uh, tendon ruptures. The same, it's it's almost like a, a Dacron sheet almost, which you sort of screw on to both ends. It comes as a sheet and you can fold it over and you can put it in both ends and you can keep it. You can so that's, I'm not mesh. sure it's available here. Yeah. You can use the hernia mesh, just roll it two, three times and it becomes like a Yeah, tape. I mean, there are commercially available large meshes specifically for this particular purpose. So I'll just come back. Yes, to Deva, I think that now we can uh, move on. Uh, Raj, Sir, Raj, I just need to answer what Pradeep has just mentioned. So when you please. are uh, revising for uh, an infected uh, TKR, I think you need to limit the amount of foreign materials you're going to actually put in there. So that you need to think because you are never very sure about, you know, getting rid of your infection. <clears throat> never very well, sure. Right. So well, right. words, uh, all those words. meds are okay if you're doing aseptic revisions or just pure absolutely, <laughs> absolutely agree. Never do it. Never do it with an infected one. This is only for non-infected ones that Absolutely. you use the mesh. Very right. Very right. But I think message. this is going to be a uh, Rajin, it's going to be a new area where I think we need to look at this patellar tendon. What I was saying is that if you face a problem like this, don't be very disheartened. There are ways to come across. And I think this is not my first case. This is my second case actually. I've got another one like this, which is also doing pretty well. So I'm now thinking that it's not a contraindication anymore. Which we uh, like, we all said that there's a contraindication. It is not a contraindication anymore. There are ways to overcome it. Thank right. you. Rajin. Uh, we have got a few yeah. cases uh, yeah. and uh, even the quadriceps rupture is not so uncommon as we think about. Yes, Deba, we can go on. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead. Uh, I will request... Uh, there, there is a question that when you started the knee mobilization, knee bending in the chat box. Yeah, so uh, first uh, one week we only allowed 30 degree bend and uh, so we slowly increased uh, as time went. But it was not like I just kept her in a sprint and no bending. So we allowed when we, we saw on the table when actually the thing was getting stretched. So first 30 degrees, 45 degrees were fine, but we still didn't allow 45. We allowed only 30. And after as three weeks, four weeks, went past weeks, kept on increasing the knee bending. So we got about 98 in the end. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, you can go ahead with your uh, presentation. Uh, which one you want, uh, Deva? Uh, the breakage one. Right. Which is... Uh, Uh, thank you, Deva. Uh, th thank you, Ronan. Uh, I'll be speaking on uh, um, a revision for the component breakage. And here is a very interesting case. Um, you have this patient uh, who has been operated for mega prosthesis uh, in Russia. Uh, this was done for a osteosarcoma of right femur in uh, uh, 2012. And this patient was having the, uh, this kind of a rotatory movement that he is showing here. Uh, the, the prosthesis which was put in was not stable. There was a rotatory uh, instability of the prosthesis. And he was able to walk with the brace that, that we are showing here. Now, these are the x-rays of the patient. Uh, and this patient uh, uh, was uh, operated upon uh, for revision. Uh, because of this rotational instability. Uh, and this, what we found is that the locking mechanism at this area uh, had failed. So this was a broken uh, uh, mechanism, locking mechanism of this uh, implant. And this was one of the implants which, uh, which they are using for the, young, for the younger patients, which will allow the 
uh, the lengthening uh, simultaneously as the age advances. Now, this is the implant, which is removed implant. And that's for the preparation. And I converted this to a mega prosthesis uh, with, the, uh, with the stem uh, and uh, rotatory hinge. And uh, incidentally, as I was mentioning about the infection, always send the implant wash for the culture and delayed culture for two weeks. In this patient, we could grow the staphylococcus bacteria. Uh, intravenous antibiotics were given for six weeks and oral antibiotics for another six weeks. And that's what this patient was, was doing. Uh, he was doing reasonably well in the immediate post-operative phase. And that's what this patient's uh, three years follow-up. He was able to do well. That's what we can see this patient walking at the follow-up of uh, three years. He was extremely happy. But the, uh, uh, the story did not end here. And you see this patient uh, at the follow-up of three years and six months. Uh, and what we probably are not able to see that there is a fracture of the stem uh, at, at this three and a half years time post-operative because this patient had, in, uh, had was so happy that he involved himself in all the activities, including some uh, kind of sports activities. That's what this patient was revised at the uh, follow-up of three years and 10 months with a thicker uh, stem. Earlier, the stem was 10 millimeter and this stem was 12 millimeter. And we had used the uh, prophylactic circlage wire uh, so that the, the uh, while reaming, this does not uh, come out. And one trick here, how we remove the broken stem, we have the oversized uh, hollow, hollow uh, mills, uh, which just go over this, uh, over the stem and then you can take out the broken stem in a very easy way. And that's for this patient. We can see at the, at the long follow-up of, I think, six years or seven years, where he was able to move on and do his, uh, carry on his life in an easy way. And we can see that this boy has grown up uh, much more. Uh, but the, uh, you, know, you can never be sure about these patients that they will have a, you will have to keep them in the follow-up and close follow-up. And what we see this patient um, at a follow-up in, in 2023. And if we see carefully, we can see that the locking mechanism uh, is failing in this. And this patient is yet to be operated for this. We have shown here with the arrow that this locking mechanism is, is, is giving a problem. And this patient is having the hyperextension. So this patient is still preoperative for his uh, third breakage of this step. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one question that this diagnosis was osteosarcoma, uh, generally a very poor prognosis type of This cancer. is the diagnosis from the Russian hospital. Sorry? Uh, this is the diagnosis yeah. from the Russian hospital. Uh, we had no uh, histopathology sample. Uh, we just had the uh, biopsy report. So we'll have to trust him that this was. Yeah. I understand your point that osteosarcoma are usually not having this much of lifespan. Yeah. There's a high chance of recurrence in these uh, recurrence right. cases. Right. But so oh. far, a uh, patient has not shown any signs of recurrence of the uh, of any kind of a cancer. Rajiv, there is a question well. that uh, any special technique to take out this cement? Uh, yes. Uh, what we do, uh, Pradeep, it, it was you who asked the question? No, no, I said the patient has done well. Yeah, patient has done well. And the but way the to remove the cement the is that first the, the broken stem, uh, we use it with the hollow mill and we keep the constant uh, irrigation with, uh, with saline so that there is no, no uh, heat necrosis to the area. And that removes significant amount of the cement. And then the best way is that you do the cement in cement kind of a uh, uh, cementation of the stem. Uh, the few uh, steps that, that are very important, and I like to mention for our, for our uh, younger colleagues here, that when you do a mega prosthesis, try to ensure that the largest size of the stem is used. The stem is seated well at the, at the, bon at the bony stem. And uh, I'm sure that Rajkumar will, will, will show some cases of this uh, more. Um, 
the seating should be good and there is a cementless portion in this uh, in this stem uh, that that cementless portion avoid putting the cement over that area the seating is very important the size of the stem should preferably be around 12 or so and these very patients should be advised very, not to follow the routine activities especially the sports activities there is a question in the chat box uh, Dr. rajiv how to give yes. implant wash and send a culture uh, can you say again please the how to give implant wash and send culture it's, it's very very important question uh, the how to send the implant wash uh, that when you remove the implant first that you should put it in a sterile container and you can send this whole sterile container to your microbiology lab where they can use the uh, use the ultrasonic uh, method uh, to to uh, irrigate the whole implant and take out the implant wash if you do not have that system then you should put the implant in a bigger tray and and, uh, and use the the uh, the saline with a with a little force uh, and keep using about uh, uh, 20 30 ml of the saline and ensure that this is the multiple times it has been irrigated. It has been saline has been put on it with a force, and then you take out uh, the uh, the sample from this and send it for the aerobic culture, anaerobic culture, tubercular culture, and uh, uh, fungal culture. Uh, and usually you do it in consultation with your microbiologist. If you have the back tech bottles available, they are the best methods to give the uh, the culture. Uh, sample in the operation theater because they are the sealed uh, bottles and you can put the uh, the some some kind of a sterilizer and then you can uh, put the uh, put the saline or the implant wash uh, with the with the use of a syringe and needle i, I think and, and you must ensure that the uh, the microbiologist is in sync with you and they keep it uh, keep observing it for a period of uh, about 2 weeks time so, which is which is called the extended culture. So, I think this these are the important things. Now, how, is this uh, more important than the tissue culture? What we take from different sites through, during the surgery? Uh, well, when, well, when you have an implant like this, and if you have a sus suspicious tissues, then you must send the tissue also for culture in addition to this. <laughs> and as uh, Shubranshu was mentioning. That you must must take out the culture. Oh, no, and in another case of a knee replacement, you must take out the culture from the medullary canal as well. Yes. No oh. ultrasonication is machines are available in some of the hospitals, <laughs> where the yeah. process is uh, you know ex expanded process and for ultrasonication and then the two uh, extended. Uh, that's that's, that's what, what I mentioned, Subhran. Yeah. Let's move on to the last case then, Deva. Uh, yeah. Yes. Rajkumar, uh, are you okay now? Because Rajkumar had some uh, problem with the uh, internet in with the. No, no. Just, just one minute. I'm just okay. doing it in from a different laptop. My screen sharing is not suddenly working. Okay. I'll uh, just. I'm doing it from uh, another laptop in another one minute. Just give me one minute. Just we. Uh, uh, in the on. meantime, Deva, we can discuss we any can of discuss? the case that has been presented so far. Uh, let's just look at the chat box. Like quite I'll, a lot. Uh, I'll have a, I have a question. Oh, uh, how many of you are using BioFire? This uh, which has come into now for the diagnosis of infection. I, I'm using Subrash. It's very uh, expensive. In fact, the uh, the guy who's the running BioFire in the whole Asia Pacific uh, was our microbiologist, yeah. and he's a very good friend of mine. Actually, uh, I have just started to... using it, and and I think this is useful uh, because in Delhi the uh, lal pathology is having it, so that probably sir, is a easier. We have it there in Max, sir. This is Ramnik. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ramnik. Yeah, good to see you. Right. Uh, so we Please, have Ramnik, it here in Max. Answer us. Actually, we have it here in Max with us, and I've been using it now for more than a year, and mm. I am telling you, I am not very happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> I have uh, Ramik, not... uh, this is just a add-on method. Uh, it's the, it is the not... thing is, even no, the I'm cases not... which we have had positive when we have sent cultures from inside the wound and those cases which are confirmed positives, the biofires in the OPDs which were sent, they always came out as negative. Mm -hmm. I have yet to get 
a positive on a biofire in the last one year that I've been doing it. And my biker, my microbiologist is actually aware of it. And he is in talks with us. So we are actually in the process of probably discontinuing sending biofire now. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you are right that, that mm -hmm. this is just an add-on uh, method. Uh, it yeah, cannot yeah, be the only method, method reliable. In Dr. Many Dr. 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 Minal, there is a question for you. How to decide between wage or sleeve in aseptic losing? This is a very broad uh, uh, question. <laughs> so it depends upon the defect, how you classify that, what is your philosophy, you want to use cones, you want to use a sleeve. There are some systems which would not have sleeves or cones available where you might have to use only wedges like uh, and probably the, the central part is a little thicker where you have to cement that. So I it think depends it should, upon the defect the and the system that, uh, you're using. Yeah, the message yeah, should very be right, that, uh, Pranal. Uh, I think the regarding the sleeves, uh, it is important that the if, if the bone is very osteoporotic, if you have a large defect and, and financially it is possible to use the costlier implant that sleeves are a good option. But as you rightly mentioned, there are other methods also available. There's also a question about wedges. I mean, by and large, wedges should be restricted to patients yeah. who have a relatively shorter life expectancy, to be very honest. Yes. And uh, because you actually end up uh, sacrificing more bone. And it's in patients who actually have osteoporotic bone and uh, you're worried that any graft is unlikely to take. But with the uh, availability of bones and metaphysical sleeves, I think wedges are gradually falling out of fashion. And if you have to use a wedge, uh, step wedge is always better than uh, an oblique wedge. Wedges would be, augments would be more useful towards the femoral side. Absolutely, not on the tibial side. So wedges should be avoided as far as possible is the... Uh thing which we should uh, be giving. Uh, I, I, they, they think the better all... answer will be that the, the sleeves are a better, uh, better give, provide the better stability. Better in region, in region you will need zone 2 fixation which can be provided with sleeves or cones and not with wedges. So well, right. they will just fill up the defect. They will not give you stability. So you need sleeves or cones or and long stems. But Rinal, I think the, we can use sleeves only when we are operating for aseptic conditions. The cones are more better when we are re revising for a septic situation in the second stage. No, I think the no, philosophy is different. If you are doing two second stage, your infection is already cured, you know. No, but still, the what the literature says is that if you are revising... Only go ahead. Uh, I think Dr. Rajkumar has, uh, uh, has prepared his uh, computer. So, Dr. Rajkumar, we'll go ahead with your uh, talk. Can you can you hear uh, Deba? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll... yes, yes, Rajkumar. Uh, uh, good evening to all. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Deba, Dr. Rajiv, and Dr. Ronan for this uh, uh, meeting and invitation. Uh, this topic uh, actually now this is the last topic which is going to get finished with the tumor processes. Uh, revision TKR with the tumor processes. Uh, the reason behind this topic is. Um, Whenever we do a revision, as we all discussed in detail about all the complex cases, we do revisions. Majority of the time, we uh, do revisions with our regular uh, constraint processes. But there are some instances where we might need to look at uh, hinged as a uh, backup. But still, there are some indications where we might even may not be use may not use a hinged processes. We need the further more uh, tumor processes. So uh, to start with, in my case. Uh, uh, this is a patient, a 74-year-old male. He's a doctor by profession. Bilateral totally done um, uh, three years back outside hospital. The surgeon uh, did it in a staged procedure. I think uh, uh, in one month's uh, time gap, he has done both the right side and left side. And uh, this is the post-operative x-ray. And four years uh, post-totally replacement presented to me with uh, loosening of the processes. And it was very obvious that the process is loose and then the patient had a lot of swelling, pain in the knee, walking and the blood parameters obviously was showing that the patient is having infection and uh, anemic also. So all parameters towards uh, septic loosening. So no, no other option. We have to remove the implants, do a two-stage procedure. That was the plan I explained to him in detail. And then I went ahead. This was the picture. Huge synovium inside, a lot of... Uh, huge synovium, a uh, lot of hypertrophy, fluid. So once everything was deprived, it took a lot of time and it was the huge thigh was, and the whole knee was very huge. So I had to 
spend a lot of time in debriding the soft tissue more than the uh, bone and the implant. So after this intraoperative, all these tissues were sent. I don't know. Everything came as negative, no growth. All the ex multiple cultures, extended cultures, fungus, uh, tuberculosis, gene expert, everything came as negative and no growth. So obviously he was uh, treated and you can see that apart from the uh, joint uh, cement spacer, I had to put a lot of cement uh, into the suprapetlar region because such an extensive dead space was there. And the patient itself was tall and big. Apart from that, the huge synovium which was excised created a lot of space. So to avoid all unnecessary collections post-operatively, I had to give uh, put a lot of cement anteriorly in the suprapetlar region. And the patient was recovering well. And all the uh, pathology report, everything was negative. And uh, treated with IV antibiotics, discussed with the infectious disease specialist, and then treated with IV. But uh, unfortunately, the patient hemoglobin was never picking up. Even after a month and two, uh, his CRP was slowly coming down. But still, his ES, uh, CR, uh, hemoglobin is like from 8.9. Again, it went to 8.5. Then I was wondering. And then he came with a huge uh, swelling uh, in the knee in the, at the two months of follow-up with a lot of fluid inside collection. And then uh, then patient was slowly telling that he was very comfortable. So he was walking with the cement spacer, with the walker, but putting full weight and he was walking. And he was tall and big also. Then I took an x-ray and then found out this. But patient was not having any much of lot of uh, not much of pain or anything no uh, obvious uh, fall but he was walking full weight bearing so he the bone uh, all crumbled like this but with the cement spacer inside it got hitched into the cement spacer and he was walking with that not much of pain but a lot of um, uh, uh, bleeding inside slowly hematoma huge collection so that was one reason for his uh, hemoglobin drop then I had to aspirate that huge collection. So much of uh, hematoma was there, aspirated, then gave him uh, uh, blood, stabilized him. And this culture, fluid was sent for culture sensitivity and it all uh, came as negative. Then the ESR uh, also, um, CRP also, infection markers also came down. And then slowly he was returning back to his uh, uh, stability of hemodynamics. And then... I planned for uh, the revision TKR and once I opened inside, you can see that there is not much of any condyles left at all. So over the period of time, in the two months time, he started walking, it was all crumbled. The whole bone, the condyles all disappeared almost. So nothing much to do here. So in the, with the x-ray, I was very much clear that he might need a uh, tumor process. So that apart from the hinge, I had a tumor process as a backup. So fortunately, that was the scenario here where I had to use the tumor processes. No way we can use a hinged processes, no condyles, nothing. Uh, and this was, the per this was the perioperative um, uh, image. And then this is the uh, limb preservation system which I used. And then the uh, it is a uh, post-operative period, one year follow-up. Now the patient is doing well. So the, the just a quick message here. Uh, why, when to use the tumor processes? Whenever there is a huge bone loss, no soft tissue ligaments. The main the main issue is we think of doing a hinge process, but we even with a for a hinged, you need some amount of metaphyseal bone. Whenever there is a meta, not much of metaphyseal bone, particularly in periprosthetic fractures, whenever there is a periprosthetic fracture of a total knee, the bone crumbles so quickly and it all disappears. So very, very careful. We have to look at it and then have a tumor process as a backup in these kind of major revision scenarios. So a rotating hinged tumor process in a severe bone loss, which is not amenable for a hinged condyle fixation, should be the process of choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, uh, how, how long should be the femoral uh, stem uh, in this uh, prosthesis, in this mega prosthesis? So actually, uh, we don't have much of uh, options available in these kind of processes because uh, they have only limited lengths because we, it's already we are taking around the, the minimal bone removal is around the 80 uh, mm. Like uh, so, you cannot uh, have too much of longer stem also, and you cannot have a shorter. So the this is the smallest length available in a cemented uh, tumor process which I have used. So if you want to build up with that, then you have to add the augment the metal uh, spacers in between the junction. So we cannot keep adding the length to main uh, to get your um, joint. 
uh, length. So you have to add metal spacers every time you want to get the uh, the more the bone resection you have to do up, then you have to keep adding the metal uh, for um, metal augments like uh, spacers, metal spacers. Any other questions uh, on this uh, topic? Deva, we can discuss that uh, question which was asked. How long to wait uh, for the second yeah. stage? That's a very, very important subject. Actually. Mm -hmm. How long to wait before? What are the antibiotic holidays? That's what you, you, many people have asked. Actually, uh, the question was uh, how far af after the first stage, how long we have to wait with the antibiotic cement? Spacer. So I think uh, it should be six to uh, two, six weeks to eight weeks, as usual. There, there, like is, that. there is no specified actually guidelines in the literature. You know, some surgeons prefer two weeks, some surgeons prefer four weeks, some surgeons do six weeks. Everywhere the surgeon have got their own, uh, you know, protocol. What uh, I follow is a six weeks of antibiotic, six weeks of antibiotic holiday, so about three months. Then you go ahead with the second stage, depending upon the, you know, if there's a downward trend of PS or CRP, then go ahead with the second stage. Yeah, and important is that in a healthy individual, if you are doing the revision for infection, and first stage, uh, you are very comfortable <coughs> that you have eradicated the infection, uh, the infection parameters are, in, are within the normal range, then you do not need to give the additional antibiotic for a long time. And this is not so in the cases where you are giving the antibiotic suppression in certain uh, susceptible individuals, the older population, rheumatoid patients, or diabetic patients. I think that's a one important point that younger surgeons should, should remember. So, Subhanshu, I wanted to ask you, so six weeks uh, antibiotic-free period, at let's yeah. say four weeks after you've stopped antibiotics, your CRP is normal. So now yeah. when, do you, when do you want to go in? No, I suppose the CRP is up and the clinical impression is important. The, the wound looks fine. There is no effusion inside the knee. Knee is not that much painful. Patient is clinically better. They, even if the CRP is you know, a little high, it doesn't matter. Then comes the intraoperative findings. You keep everything ready for the second stage reconstruction, but also keep cement spacer standby. In case intraoperatively, I see there is some granulation tissue, somewhere suspicious tissue. Then I send it for a progen section, intraoperatively fine progen section. If there are, you know, uh, plenty of pause cells or something like that, then I will put again a spacer, do a debridement, and then come out rather than putting a second joint in. Dr. Mahanti, would you would you aspirate the joint before second stage? Yeah, if there is a, uh, always ESR, CRP, and aspiration are always the hallmark of diagnosis. But uh, sometimes if you see the joint is dry, then aspiration, nothing comes out in aspiration. In those kind of cases, if the ESR CRP is a downward trend almost reaching normal, then we go ahead with the second stage, even if we don't get anything in aspiration. But during the second stage, again, if, even if you are putting a, you know, uh, re-implantation, doing a re-implantation, that time also take a biopsy from, multiple, I mean, culture from multiple sites, from intramedullary area, parapetular gutter, suprapetular pouch, everything. Sometimes you'll be surprised uh, to see that uh, maybe one of the samples may grow some, some you know, organism, then you have to put these patients on extended period of uh, antibiotic and pray God that it should not get infected again. Uh, right, Shubhranchu. Ramni, you have a question, please? Yes, sir. I just wanted to no, Ramnik, mention yes, is please. the literature does say that if you have an anti positive culture, so then you probably are good enough that the waiting period is around six weeks once you've treated them. But so I on the other question, sorry, then it is like if you have a positive culture which you have treated for six weeks and you have a trend which has settled down, then a waiting period of two weeks to three weeks is good enough to go in. Correct. But when you do not have a positive culture, then a waiting period of six weeks is good enough. Not necessarily. In, in fact, Ramni, what you rightly mentioned that the culture negatives are the biggest issue. Yes. Shubhranshu, you, you agree with no, this, the culture no, negative? No, 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 I, I don't agree with it. You know, basically, you need to see that uh, whether there is a recurrence of infection during this time, that there the patient's immunity is important. 
you know if the patient is immunocompetent then he may not have a recurrence of infection but if the patient is immunocompromised then uh, if you leave this patient without antibody there there is a possibility of recurrence of infection and your reimplantation may fail afterwards so, right. so stage 1 the- stage 2 that's what you are doing you are building up immunity so if you are hmm. building up immunity and there was a period where you had a culture positive then you have treated the patient you build the immunity you can go ahead in 2 to 3 weeks not not that uh, uh, some surgeons go ahead with two, two weeks three weeks some surgeons go ahead even without waiting for uh, any antibiotic pre period so there are there are I personal variations of yeah, different surgery i'm telling you what i follow i i play very safe and that's why i wait for six weeks uh, so one 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 important uh, thing here in infection when you yeah. have a culture negative situation before you which yeah. antibiotics you prefer for the benefit of audience Uh, if the patient's creatinine is normal and uh, if the patient is not a renal compromised patient, then I give linezolid and amikacin as my antibiotic of choice. But if the patient is you know immunocompromised, then I give uh, linezolid as well as ciplox. So linezolid covers the gram positive MRSA, and uh, you know this uh, other antibody aminoglycosides or ciprofloxacin covers the gram negative organ. But yeah, th- Doctor Monty, I would disagree here. But, uh, but Doctor uh, Rajiv. Doctor yeah, Rajiv, uh, sorry, I yeah, would Ramani, disagree please. here because linezolid is bacteriostatic; it's not bacteriocidal. Hmm. Hmm. And yeah. giving and giving long term linezolid is actually toxic to your eyes as well as it causes a lot of pnea in these patients. Hmm. Uh, linezolid is more, very in, difficult. In, 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 linezolid, linezolid. Why I prefer because you can give intravenously as well as oral form is available. That is, no, but that it's static. Use, but yeah. what you need is bacterial static. Yeah, yeah. You don't need something which is yeah, bacterial static. Adding, you are giving combination of antibiotic. I'm giving the you know aminoglycosides like, also. But there's. Can you uh, say what you want? A comment, Mridal. You have a comment. I I so don't necessarily want... give any higher antibiotic uh, for you know think, to prevent the antibiotic resistance. Uh, I think this. Uh, uh, I prefer a higher antibiotic when I've got a sensitivity proper sensitivity to that yeah, antibiotic. This, then only I uh, use higher antibiotic. Mahanti, I think, I think uh, inadvertently this, one should not use a higher antibiotic. This discussion will continue. This discussion actually is case based. Any particular case can be different in um, the particular situation. So Mridal, uh, after you tell your uh, comments, we'll uh, close this because we are already. I just want to ask one last question to all the panelists. When would you choose an orthodesis over revision, Dr. Subranshu? Right. For me, twice, twice revised. If it fails, I will prefer an orthodesis. The problem is that by that time, the lot of bone stock is gone, so it is difficult to achieve a you know bone to bone orthodesis. If bone stock is available, then I would prefer a You know, bone to bone arthrodesis using a intramedullary long intramedullary nail, or else I will prefer to put a those cam titan uh, you know arthrodesis kind of nail, Radeep. which is very expensive but uh, it provides immediate stability and uh, it is really I'm happy with. Yeah, yeah, Radeep, the other your, place uh, would be to uh, in patients who got extensive mechanism failure. Yeah, yeah, I think there are several factors that are come into play. Finances is very important. Patient's immunity yeah. is also very important. And if none of these are an issue, I'll probably try till there's bone stock or uh, the patient says stop. Hmm. I think here in our country, finances, the type of bug, as well as the patient's immunity, plays a huge role in making your, your decision making. Agreed. I think, uh, Dr. Ronan, you wanted to tell something. No, I mean, I just wanted to say that uh, I, uh, we can continue talking to the cows come. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's what infection is. Uh, <laughs> topic, like, uh, one so comment. I think I think we'll close here. I think we'll close here. Deva, I just want to say uh, one comment. Uh, one. Uh, Pradeep, Deva, Pradeep, I just want to say. Last. Uh, Pradeep Bagheja, Doctor Pradeep Bagheja. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pradeep, yeah. Uh, please. Uh, please yeah. welcome. Last comment before we close it up. We are discussing a lot of infection, but nobody is involving our infection control specialist because microbiologists in our hospital they are very trained, and we should involve them in one. Once we admit the patient, please take one consultation with them and talk to them very clearly what you want from the patient and the surgeon because we are we are surgeons. First, they are dealing with the infection day to day. They know what is the best. Yes. But we follow only the protocols. What is available with us? With the lab. Uh, Pradeep, I think it's a very, very right comment yeah. from your side. 
uh, and uh, uh, Deba, uh, before you close, uh, I'll request, uh, I'll thank all the participants, all the speakers uh, on behalf of Ronan and Indian Arthroplasty Association and would remind you all once again what Ronan has mentioned that the next webinar is on a very interesting subject of uh, dislocation, dislocating THR, uh, the, which will be done, which will be convened by uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Anil uh, uh, from Velour, yeah. Anil Uman from, from Velour, uh, and this will be, a, a, please uh, put it in your, in your diary uh, yeah. on a Thursday at 7.30 p.m. And just uh, thank you so much, Ronan and Deepa, please. Just, 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 just a quick addition uh, before we close, I mean, for anyone who's listening and still hasn't registered for our IACON in Chandigarh, please make sure that you do come, because I think we've got a extravaganza lined up for you. We're hammering, hammering you with the invites from all the all the faculty who will be there. And uh, so we look forward to seeing you all in person in Chandigarh between the 13th and 15th of October. Over to Deva for closing comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ronan. Actually, I thought of giving you for the closing comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, you all the thank you all the uh, all the participants uh, of the program. Uh, actually, the participants make the webinar a success. Thank you all the speakers. It was a nice uh, discussion of uh, revision scenario, difficult scenario, how to manage a difficult uh, T care. Uh, there are so many other points which uh, we have missed, which could not be covered in this uh, one and a half hours uh, webinar. We can cover it in another webinar. These webinars will be very helpful for uh, later on for uh, seeing and uh, uh, getting updated. So these are very important and we should continue this one. Uh, I think some closing remarks from the president is needed here. Over well, to that. Uh, very right. Uh, okay. Well, I'd like to just uh, continue with what, in the same way that Devas actually told you that this is actually uh, part of the library that's available online. And all 34 of the previous webinars are available. And uh, in case you want to go back and revisit it or want to have a difficult case, you can always go back. And in fact, uh, a lot of us uh, on the faculty also often do this to just uh, see what we're dealing with and if we can pick up some pointers from all our eminent colleagues. So pass it on to your friends and uh, make sure that uh, the IA uh, 360 degree webinars stay healthy and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the 5th of October. I thank you all for joining this evening. Thank you and uh, see you, you in Chandigarh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Can we stop recording? We'll be stopping the live uh, recording now. <laughs> then um, just a couple of things we can discuss. I think we just wait for, for a few uh, seconds. People uh, who are from outside as well, actually, at the moment. So it's not just the faculty. Just five seconds more, it will be stopped.